here's your opportunity to listen and learn from the most successful people driving growth and success in Palm Beach County and beyond. Welcome to the Business in Paradise Palm Beach podcast with Carrie Stamp, founder of Carrie Stamp and Company, Principled Wealth Advisors. Carrie and his guests share stories and insights from Palm Beach County's most successful executives, entrepreneurs, and community leaders. Learn how they made it to where they are today, what principles guide them, how they mentor others to achieve success, and more. Hello, this is Kerry Stamp. I'm your host for the Business in Paradise podcast. And today I have a tremendous guest. He's a gentleman that I've known for a long time. I have Dr. Jerry Pulvermacher, who is the owner of Gerald Pulvermacher and Associates, based right here in South Florida, but he works with clients all over the world. And Jerry is an industrial psychologist by background and has developed a business working with business owners that want to transition their businesses to the next generation or businesses where they just want to be able to work smoother with the executive teams and function a little bit better in their operations. So Jerry Pulvermacher, welcome to the Business in Paradise podcast. Pleasure to be here, Carrie. Jerry, tell us a little bit about your background. You're in South Florida now, but you didn't start out here in South Florida. And some of the words that you use, I noticed earlier when we were talking, actually uncorrected yourself. You said process, and then you went to process. So where are you from, Jerry? So I'm uh, Canadian and grew up in Montreal. And after finishing graduate school, moved to the capital of Canada, which is Ottawa, and was practicing there for 23 years. And uh, lo and behold, our firm that we developed, which was a combination clinical psychology practice with three offices and a consulting practice with four offices in Canada, the firm was acquired by Deloitte Consulting, and they asked me to move to New York to be one of their global directors, leading a number of service lines, and that's what started the journey into the United States. And, And now I'm actually both a Canadian and U.S. citizen. So, Jerry, growing up in Canada, tell us a little bit about what that was like. You're in Montreal, Canada, which I've never been to. I've always wanted to go there, but I understand it's an amazingly beautiful city. What did your family do in in Canada, and what was your background? Well, my parents are both Holocaust survivors. I was actually born in a displaced persons camp, and we immigrated to Canada in late 1948. My father was a tailor, and the Canadian government after the war, and Montreal was a garment district in Canada, needed tailors. And he was one of about 2,000 tailors that were taken out of the displaced persons camp, known as Bergen-Belsen. And uh, my parents and I uh, immigrated to Canada, and specifically to Montreal. As you said, Montreal is an absolutely gorgeous city. Uh, It's on the St. Lawrence Seaway. And it's a bilingual city, which makes it very European-like in its flavor. And when you go to school, you learn English and French, not only English. And, uh, and nowadays, in fact, it's uh, what they call French immersion, so it's actually mandatory. You learn every subject except English in French. And so that was part of the experience of growing up in Montreal is being bilingual. I'm sorry, go back to Bergen-Belsen for just yeah. a moment. You were... There as a child, you were born there both. or both? You were born both. in the... In the camp. In the camp. Yeah. Is this after the war? After the war, yeah. Okay, so the war is over. Your folks have made it through, thankfully. They were, at that point, they, they were both single. My dad lost his first family in the ghetto. And my mother escaped from her fam- with her, a couple of members of her family to Russia, and they hid through most of the war. My dad, on the other hand, was in uh, three concentration camps, and he was one of the last groups liberated from Auschwitz. People at the time knew that uh, there were these camps that they could go to, and it just happened that my mother and dad met in the camp, not unlike a lot of other uh, survivors, and within a few weeks they were married. And that's just the way it was, and, uh, and I happened to be born there. And so apparently Canada needed tailors? Canada needed tailors, specifically in, in, that, in those days, Montreal, Winnipeg were major garment districts, and there were factories galore. And my dad, who's a tailor, was actually uh, placed to work in a furrier's company manufacturing furs. Nowadays, that's not, a, <laughs> that's not a very favorite topic for many, but that's what he did. And then he went into his own tailor shop and uh, grew that business and had a very successful career. 
And what was life like for your mother? Was she, in, uh, she working wor- also? Yeah, she worked alongside my dad and because they added a dry cleaning plant to their tailoring shop. And she basically ran the dry cleaning aspect of the business. And yeah, and that's a, that's what they did. And so the, your parents became business owners eventually? Basically, yeah. They're business owners. Okay. Do you have siblings, Jerry? Yeah, I have a sister living out in uh, Bel Air, California. And my brother-in-law, who just sold his business a couple of years ago, probably had uh, one of the largest infomercial businesses in the world. If you're familiar with the Magic Bullet, sure, they, that's one of his products. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That had to be a lot of fun growing up or following his story. Oh, his story was, uh, it was there were many fast, many chapters to his story. This was the latest one, but it was the one that was the most successful by far. And uh, he really built a phenomenal business, an entire chain of aspects that go into it, the production, the call centers, etc. All right, so we're going back to Montreal. Yeah. You're, you're a kid, <laughs> all yeah. right? You're uh, growing up there. At some point, you decide that uh, you want to be something when you grow up. Right. What was the process of that like? You went from high school to college somewhere, and and what was your thinking? Well, ironically, uh, you know, we we all have our high school yearbooks, and one of the questions that asks you is, what career do you want to follow? And and we graduated from high school in Quebec in those days at grade 11, and I had said psychiatrist. And I didn't know what a psychologist was at the time. I just knew psychiatry. And I grew up amongst survivors, right? And all the, I didn't speak English until I was about six and a half, seven years of age. And so I grew up amongst all these survivors. And you could, I mean, I saw what was going on. It was, it's not something one can easily characterize other people. And so you sort of have to learn how to navigate and deal with people. And I was always fascinated with that. And uh, so it was by no surprise that once I graduated, I did the general things one does in first year undergraduate school. But then I started to go into a major in psychology and got an honors degree in undergraduate psychology and went on to graduate school. It was that in Canada? Yeah. I did my master's degree and my doctoral degrees at the University of Windsor, which was right across the river from Detroit. And we had to put in something like 3,000 hours of internship in our doctoral year and 2,000 in our master's years. And several of those internships were actually in Detroit because many of the faculty in Windsor were from Detroit. And so are you thinking that you're uh, going to have a career as a psychologist, psychiatrist, and you're going to just treat individual patients? That's exactly what I thought I was going to do. And in fact, when I left school, I, that's what I did do. I uh, saw patients and uh, built, there weren't very many private practicing psychologists. And I was always the kind of person who wanted to manage my own show. So I could have readily gone into a hospital setting or a school setting or in one of these type of settings, but I just wanted to do private practice. And because there were very few, there may be two or three other psychologists in private practice, I built a practice pretty quickly. And within about three years, we had three offices and 12 psychologists working in those offices. So you're an initially an entrepreneur, almost right out of the gate. Yeah. You start building this psychology practice. Was this your business or did you have some partners? Initially, I had my own, it was my own business, uh, but I was uh, dealing almost exclusively with, uh, my training was to work with adults. And so I ran into a fellow who was the chief psychologist at one of the school boards, and he was ready to move into private practice. So we decided to join forces. So he started to develop a clinical practice focused on kids and families, whilst I continued working with individuals and couples. And so the psychologists in the practice either worked in one domain or the other. At this time, are you in your 20s? I was. I graduated as 25, and I was in my 20s, yeah. And so what happens next? You form this practice, you, you get all these uh, <laughs> psychologists and working together, and then you decide that... Uh, seeing 35 to 40 patients a week, an hour each, plus all the assessment work, all the reporting that you have to do, all the meetings with physicians, et cetera. Where, so you're putting in about a 70-hour week on a typical practice week, and which I enjoyed doing, by the way. I enjoyed it. However, I knew I was going to burn myself out. And I'd always had an interest in business, uh, coming from the background I came from, being around the people I came from. And ironically, one day, one of my patients who had been referred for stress management, he 
had had heart disease, was the owner of a large real estate company. And he claimed that you know, I saved his life, you know, by teaching him the stuff that I taught him. And he said, you got to come in and talk to my executive team about managing stress. Now, we're talking here about 1974, 1975, before this became de rigueur and very popular. And so I went in and I did this lecture and they just loved it. They said, oh, you know, we, I talked about it generally, but they wanted to actually learn the skills. So I had to put together a training program. So I put together this training program and lo and behold, there's a training company that heard about me and asked me to come and do some training for them in a business context. And they said, what else can you teach? And so I developed another, another program and another program. So before you knew it, I was teaching about eight or nine different programs and doing less and less clinical work. But back then, I also had developed a consulting side to the business. So we had a clinical side with one partner looking after it, another psychologist who had a doctorate in industrial psychology looking after the consulting firm. And because I was, I, I sort of crossed in both areas, I'd gone back to get some training and I skipped over that step, but I had gone back to get some training. I was the managing partner of the firm and doing all my work eventually by about 1981, 82, I was doing all my work on the consulting side. Now, at this point, had you met your wife? Oh, I met my wife way before that. I was in second year university. She was in first. We had, there was a mandatory class. I can't remember what it was. I mean, oh yeah, it was Natural Science 210. <laughs> and everybody had to take that course. And the building that we were taking the course in was named after the guy who taught the course. So it was mandatory. And um, that university is called Concordia University. It's one of the two majors in Montreal, the one being McGill. And so I sat, happened to be sitting next to her and uh, took a shine to her. And um, we've been now married 52 years. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. And along the way, you had some children. And was that during this period where you're starting to build your own business? Uh, no, it was before that. Really? <laughs> yes, it was before that. So I was in my first doctoral year. And we, I'd, we'd been married two years, and we had our first child, and then uh, subsequently we had another. So I have two daughters, and one's in her 50s, early 50s. The other one is her mid-40s, and I've got five grandchildren. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. So we get back to the time when you're building this consulting firm and this uh, practice of psychology, and you're kind of focusing on some business owners and some consulting. Take us through how that grew and uh, how you eventually exited from that particular chapter. So, you know, we started building up a clientele. There weren't, in Canada, there were just a handful of in psychologists who focused on industry and business. And so, first of all, we were not allowed to advertise. There's the regulations govern psychologists in Canada are very, they're very British-like, okay? And you can only, it's only word of mouth and referral. You, you can't put ads in the paper and whatever. So it's all word of mouth. Uh, but because there were so few of us doing this kind of work, and most of them were in Toronto, and I was in Ottawa, which is a government city plus high tech, I just the, the word just spread from one client to the next, and and we just started to get become busier and busier. Much of which was initially on training. Those were the years when there were a lot of these uh, major events where Tom Peters in Search of Excellence would have a thousand people in his audience, and he'd be teaching them courses on how to create excellent organizations. Well, we were much more, I thought, not so much generic and high level, but rather skill based training. And we had courses on leadership development and uh, communication skills and assertive leadership and the like. And so the word grew and we started uh, doing these training courses in-house and companies invite us in to do these, this kind of training. And then the university, one of the universities called me and asked if I would be an adjunct professor at the university in the business school and teach a couple of courses there as well. And of course, these were all mature students coming from companies. And they would say, oh, we need to bring this in-house. So it'd be, it just snowballed from their bottom line. And then I realized that some of these courses, I could tell you what time it was by the joke I told because they were they're highly repetitive. They weren't all customized. And it was getting to be a bit boring. So I decided that I needed to learn more about consulting, and which was more sort of stimulating and problem-solving oriented. And you had to figure out projects and solutions and deliverables and timelines and how you work with the client and not work on the client. And so I went and took various courses that allowed me to learn how to do that. And lo and behold, Deloitte came along as a client. And we designed and delivered leadership in, in Canada to start with. 
We designed and delivered uh, leadership development programs for their top 120 partners who are geographic leaders, service line leaders, and industry leaders. And the word got out, and then the U.S. firm came to look at us, and they brought us in to do work with their leaders. So at one point in time, we had close to a dozen members of our firm working in Deloitte, running all these programs, and I was also running it, but project managing the whole thing. So initially, you were outside of Deloitte. That's correct. And then how did you get inside to Deloitte? So uh, um, one of the things Deloitte realized, and we're talking about Deloitte Consulting, not Deloitte and Touche, the accounting audit firm. It's, the same, it's owned by the same body, but it's two, two distinct entities. They were doing a lot of work in what's called ERP implementation. These are major software, transformational, organizational transformational software. They were doing M&A work, strategy work, etc. And what they realized in working with these companies, which were, you know, behemoth companies, I mean, Deloitte's the largest professional services firm on the planet, is that they were only realizing 30 to 40 percent of the benefits they had been promising to their clients. And the realization was that if you didn't align the people, the teams, and the organization with the changes that were taking place, you wouldn't get the benefits that you wanted to arrive at when you promised the client. And they recognized that they needed some people in there who could address the change management issues, the people development issues, the training issues, and the like. So I guess our firm, which was then called Paul Vermacher, Stevens, and Shaq. Stevens ran the clinical, Shaq ran the industrial, and I was the managing partner. And they decided that, to make a play for us, as they say. And they acquired the consulting firm. Uh, we sold a clinical practice uh, a couple of months later to a group of physicians. and But we came in as partners, and we had at that point, oh, I'd say probably about three dozen people working for us, and they all went into the firm. A couple of them decided they actually wanted to do their own thing and didn't want to go into a large organization. And uh, within a couple of months of joining Deloitte in Canada, I got a call from New York asking if I was in interested in building these kinds of services globally for Deloitte. So that takes us from 96, 90, 1996, 1997. All right, so you are in an entrepreneurial culture. You're the managing partner, you're running your own show. And you go from, hey, I'm making the decisions every single day to now I'm inside of this large organization and I've got to report up the chain. Right. What was that adjustment like? I thought about that a lot. And I said they didn't buy this firm and want me in this role. So I could simply be a yes man or a corporate type guy. They, they brought me in because I think they wanted someone with that entrepreneurial build the practice from the ground up spirit. So I, I don't think I ever lost step. In fact, I think I was quite respected by my peers because I, I just didn't meet the, fit the mold. I didn't grow up within the firm. Uh, and I understood the culture, and I understood what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. And I would stretch the boundaries a little bit from time to time, but for most of the part, I didn't see any reason why I couldn't do what I was doing within a firm that was highly, highly successful. Like, why would I do things that dramatically different when I looked around? I said, my goodness, these guys are earning billions and billions of dollars in fees, only in fees. Why would I, why would I do that differently? So I learned, I learned the model and started to cobble together uh, some senior people, and we built a practice around that. So internal to Deloitte, you build this team inside, you take it to the United States, you take it to other Deloitte offices probably around the world. Globally. And then is, is the goal from there to take it outside to their clients. So first it's internal. Deloitte was a client? It was never internal. <coughs> it was never uh, internal. It was, it was never internal. It was always uh, client facing. And it was a, a set of services that included change management, which we changed to change leadership. And there's a reason for that. There was executive development and learning. And there's a reason for that. Human capital and all the issues around that. Organizational design and some strategy work. So there were essentially five lines of service. And, um, and the idea was that we would build a methodology and tools that allow our practitioners in our service lines to deliver their services, but we'd integrate all those tools and processes with every other service line. So it became part of the process that we bring to the client, not as an add-on, but rather it was, it was substantial and it was integrated with everything that we brought to the table. 
Jerry, do you remember, or is there a good story about uh, your time working at Deloitte where you went into a particularly difficult situation and the team that you put together made some amazing changes? Uh, it's been a few years. It's been a few years, Gary. I say yes. Uh, we One of those that comes to mind is Prudential Financial. Uh, they were going to demutualize. And that was a really major step for that organization. And in addition to the financial structures and the organizational structures that they had, they really had to change the mindset of the people and the way people made decisions and turn them more into entrepreneurs and understand more about risk management and the, all the various elements of not being a mutual type company. And there were some of the major processes. There was a lot of technology that was introduced. There were some issues around strategy, but the culture change was a bit different. The leader, the way people led was different. And we had to help this organization go through a whole change management process. And it took us several years to do that. And ironically, I lived at that time in New Jersey, and literally the head office was down the street from where I lived. It was a very, very few times in my life at Deloitte where I could actually almost bicycle to work, whereas normally I'd have to get on planes, trains, and automobiles. I literally could go down the street. That had to be kind of nice. Though. It was a real change. And yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. So uh, and I can totally relate to what you're talking about with Prudential because as a mutual insurance company, and I do some business with mutual insurance companies, their objective is truly to protect the interests of the policyholders mm -hmm. because those are the people that own the company. Right. And when you go through this demutualization process, you take the stock that uh, these policyholders uh, have earned because they've had policies with these insurance companies. You give the stock to the policyholders, mm -hmm. and then they become the owners, but they can sell it now right. on an exchange. And Pru went public under the symbol PRU, and people could buy the stock and they could sell the stock. But now the management has to be thinking differently right. because a public company is followed by analysts. Right. And Wall Street is looking for what's going to happen next 90 days, what's Correct. in the next quarter, not... What's in the next 10 years? Very, diff very different set of behaviors and, di and different metrics that people get evaluated on and a different culture within the organization, for sure. Yeah. Great example, Jerry. So how long were you at, uh, at Deloitte? I was there for nine years, and then um, I reached the mandatory retirement age. I had an idea for another business. And I discovered in speaking to some of the retired partners what, what goes on for partners at Deloitte when you're in your last year. They take away your clients. <laughs> You've got to go through a transition plan. You've got to train the next gen of, of uh, partners to take over. So you're doing a lot of mentoring, a lot of handing off and this sort of thing. And uh, it came at a time, the time I was about to retire, inflation was really high. Interest rates were really high. The Sarbanes-Oxley had come out and you know the whole issue of you know consultants work on clients that were also audited by that firm. All these issues hit the Y2K stuff was, was just, had just come around the corner. So there were a lot of changes going on. And so I had this idea. So I went to my boss, the managing partner, and explained that I'd like to leave a few months early and um, would they support me and so forth. And we worked out an arrangement and I actually went out and started another business with a buddy of mine uh, who I convinced this was a really good idea. Uh, he left his firm, and we started down this road. And actually, Deloitte not only treated me very fairly, but I left, they gave me a very big project. And so Vincent, my partner then, and I started on this project, which helped the transition period. And ironically, Carrie, we sold that business within a year. Wow. Yeah. What was that uh, business? Well, I had this. I, I was watching what was going on in the human capital space, and all the um, uh, training that was uh, being delivered was looking at the rank and file from management on down. Tons, of, because that's where the money was. It's high volume and so forth. Nobody was paying attention to executives and executive talent management. And this goes back, we're talking like 2003, 2004. And so in 2005, I left uh, towards the end of 2005 and hooked up with Vincent. And we decided we were going to acquire small mom and pop training operations that had unique intellectual property and a book that went along with it. And in our thought, we could repurpose this from a small application to large global companies training large numbers of executives. 
And we actually, within less than a year, we acquired three small companies based on, we acquired them through the revenues we were earning by consulting. And we did put a little bit of money of our own into it as well. Along came a executive recruiting firm and the executive recruiters were struggling with their core business, which was recruiting executives. And they were looking for other sources of revenue. And we were approached by a company that trades on NASDAQ and uh, they were in the executive recruiting and staffing business, and they acquired our firm. So we actually sold the firm within 12 months of having started. So did you go to work for them for a little while? For a little while, yeah, we did. And we were obliged to work for the, with them for the year. At the end of that year, as it turned out, my younger daughter had triplet boys back up in Canada. And so I was going to go back to work with uh, Vincent, and But I had to go back up to Canada to help our younger daughter with these three boys who collectively did not weigh five pounds. Wow. And that was quite the experience. And so my wife and I you know, rolled up our sleeves and when we were along with some additional help and, and friends who helped. And uh, it was quite a, quite a year or two. And uh, I was up there for a year, a little over a year. And then I got a call from a company called Oliver Wyman. I don't know if that rings any bells. There. Oliver Wyman is part of the... Uh, MMC Corporation, which owns Marsh McLennan and Mercer and Oliver Wyman Financial Services. There was a division of Oliver Wyman called Oliver Wyman Delta. It used to be called Delta Consulting, and Mercer bought Delta Consulting. Uh, MMC moved Delta Consulting into Oliver Wyman, and it turns out the fellow who owned Delta Consulting was now one of the vice chairs of Marsh. He heard I was back in Canada, and he asked me if I would be president of Oliver Wyman Delta. And so I said, um, I thought about it. I said, sure, why not? And they wanted me to, uh, they were in Toronto. And because I knew the Canadian marketplace, they wanted to expand into some other cities. And within the year, we expanded to Montreal and uh, Calgary and Vancouver. And so we had four offices. And, uh, but I wanted to move back to the U.S., which brings us down to Florida. <laughs> and that's where we get into the paradise part yes. of the Business in Paradise podcast. Right. So you were in Canada. Had you been in Florida previously or off and on? Uh, my folks had a place in Hallandale for many, many years. So I knew Florida because as a kid, we used to, and even when I was married with our children, our young children, we used to come and visit, you know, a couple of times a year we'd come down. But I became a bit of a golfer. My wife is more of a golfer <laughs> than I am. And at the time, I didn't think I was going to want to work full time anymore. Um, and so I started working half time. And I figured the other half time I'd play and half time I'd consult and just do my own thing. No partners, no staff, just do my thing. And that's what I started to do. Yeah, Jerry, that uh, parallels my story uh, quite a bit because when I was living in Chicago, I had uh, decided and Sharon and I had truly decided that we wanted to make a transition to South Florida. And at the time that I came down was 2006 and everything was great. But within 18 months, the world fell apart. And so... I'm down here. I'm in Florida. It's absolutely beautiful. I've got a business in Chicago that I'm commuting back one week a month, and it can be run fairly easily. But I've got a lot of extra time on my hands because a lot of the folks that I was working with, especially in the construction and the real estate industry, were not looking for a financial advisor mm. in 2007 or 2008. They were looking for a bankruptcy lawyer or somebody to help them do some restructuring. And so I was in a position where I got to play a lot of golf and realized that I had absolutely made the right decision to move to this part of the world. So many of our clients now have built over the years substantial businesses in uh, South Florida. And I know that if you have the opportunity, it's probably like your experience in New Jersey where you get to work down the street from Prudential Insurance, yeah. that if you can work with South Florida companies and especially spend almost the entire winter down here, it's got to be fantastic. Yeah, no, it's 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 worked out very well. We've been here now, I think it's a little over 15 years, and I still maintain a home up in Canada because my kids and grandkids are up there. So we, we're kind of like reverse snowbirds where we spend a few months a year up in Canada avoiding the winters because as they start to wear on you as you get older. There's no question about it. Uh, and then the balance at a time, I'm either here or traveling for work. All right. And so, Jerry, you now have a new consulting practice, right. which has kind of been reconstituted in, in the not too distant past, right? Right. Tell us a little bit about that and what you're doing. Okay. So, uh, 
there is a serious circumstances that uh, resulted in my having my practice start up again. And it was basically I wanted to keep myself busy. And I approached a few of my colleagues and said, look, I'm thinking of starting up the company. Would you be interested in joining me? And we'll go out there and do this kind of work. And they said, oh, we'll buy in, we'll buy in. I said, there's nothing to buy. I said, every cent I earn, I take out. <laughs> so, so there's no way of evaluating this thing. I said, I have a brand. I know it'll bring in some business. Maybe that's worth something. But I said, why don't we all work together and try to build something that may have some value in two, three years' time? And uh, lo and behold, we ran into a company out of uh, Geneva that has clients, their global clients, in what's called the ultra high net worth space with businesses that are global and families that are global. And so that forced me to start thinking more broadly than having resources in Canada, the US. And so going back to my Deloitte days, et cetera, I knew people literally all over the world, people who would fit this model. So make a long story short, I have people in Canada, in Florida, London in the UK, and also in Singapore in part to work on clients that we may source ourselves, but in, in large part, though, to there to support the work we get from this organization that has access to these ultra high net worth families, these global families with brand names that most people would recognize. And they have the same succession issues that every family has. It's just that their family business is maybe several hundred years old and, you know, seventh, eighth and ninth generation as opposed to first, second and third generation. You know, and I ask this question of almost every guest that I have on the podcast, but you might be uniquely situated to be able to answer it because it's almost a psychology question. So one of the challenges that most business owners have is trying to figure out a great work-life balance. So what's the key, Jerry? <laughs> the key is defining what is balance. I think that everybody has to define that themselves. And uh, one shouldn't be subject to people saying, well, why don't you retire or why don't you work less? I mean, for many people, their work, especially a family business, is part of who they are. And to say to them, you know, you should work less or it's time to hang them up is not good advice. People know when they're ready and uh, are ready to work less or not work at all. And most of them don't succumb to pressure. Occasionally they do and they often regret it. Like I live in a community where a lot of the folks are retired and they'll ask me what I do. And I say, well, I work uh, right now. I work a little bit more than half time. I work probably three quarters time. And I say, well, why don't you stop working? And I said, well, why are you asking me the question? What, what's relevant about my stopping working? Why should I stop working? And they don't have an answer. And, and I asked them, are they happy with the decision that they made? And there's a look that comes over their face. They say, I'd like to work a little bit. Okay, that's the, uh, the most frequent answer I get. So there is some degree of regret. They thought they could golf six, seven days a week. I remember telling one of my clients who said to me, when they're going to retire, they're going to golf a lot. I said, okay, for the next two weeks, I want you to promise me you're going to golf every single day. And they came back into the office and I tried it. I can't do this. Right? You've got to have more variety. In my case, what am I going to replace work with, which I really enjoy, and I've been doing this for almost 50 years, with something that's even more enjoyable? So I, I say to myself, as long as I'm enjoying it and I have some value or cachet in the marketplace, why don't I just keep doing it? And I do, may do less of it over time. And I've got a dozen people now working with me so I can delegate work and oversee it and teach and train and, and advise and so forth. But I feel I have the best, the best of both worlds. And uh, being my own owner, I can take off when I want. So uh, I, I do that. I, I build in some real space for that. You know, that's a great point. And you started that conversation with. It's how you define balance. And I had a guest a few months ago on the podcast who is probably one of the largest real estate agents in maybe the United States, but certainly in Florida. He'll probably sell a billion dollars worth of real estate this year. And when I asked him the same question, how do you maintain a work-life balance? He looked at me and he just said, what is balance? Yeah, He uh, is full throttle all the time, and that's uh, literally his definition of himself and how he uh, views himself and defines success. Can I give you an example of that really speaks to that point? There is a case study that was done of a Chinese family whose business was a thousand years old. That's probably the oldest businesses I've ever heard of. And, you know, in most families, and certainly in North America, they say when you're at the kitchen table, no talk about work, you know, no shop talk. 
in this family, that was, in fact, the scourge. The talk at the table, when they asked them, they tried to figure out what was the magic sauce that kept this business so vibrant and successful over a 1,000 years. Even IBM didn't make it to 50 or 60 years before they were in serious trouble. Long story short, it was they accepted this as part of their lives, that the business was, in fact, part of their culture, their family culture. Now, they also built in certain periods of time where they would shut down in the sense of as a family, they would have nothing to do with the business, their vacations, et cetera, et cetera. But, but for the most part, they acknowledged and accepted that business as part of who they were. So, Jerry, over the years, you know, what you've identified is uh, – an amazing string of successes amongst business owner families. One of the things that I think has helped frame who I've become as a business owner and maybe some of the things that I now share with my clients are some of the things that I've learned, some of the stories that I've heard, and some of the things that I've read. So in your background, if you were talking to business owners, new business owners or second generation business owners, Are there books, are there materials, are there things that you think these are just basic fundamental training things like Dale Carnegie or Napoleon Hill? Yeah, there are a few books that come to mind that I recommend. One from an organizational perspective is From Good to Great. I think Jim Collins' book is really open my open one's mind to what makes for great companies. From a point of view of managing people, there's a book out there, there's a small little book written by somebody, Marilee Goldberg Adams, called Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. And instead of people feeling they have to, leaders feeling they have to have the right answers, the philosophy is a good leader asks the right questions. And question thinking is a methodology that Marilee has come up with. And the other book I highly recommend, and and this is endemic to what all leaders have to do, they have to know how to lead change. And the work by John Cotter on change leadership and leading change, he's written umpteen numbers of books. I'd highly recommend his books on leading change. And actually, his article on why transformation fails was the most frequently requested reprint in Harvard Business Review of all time. And John Cotter? John Cotter, K-O-T-T-E-R. Okay. He's also written another book with a former colleague of mine, Dan Cohen, called The Heart of Change, which I would also recommend, The Heart of Change. Those are great examples, Jerry. And a lot of times people make mistakes, and we've all made mistakes early in our career. Sometimes we made them late in our career, and we just kind of figured <laughs> out how we're going to pivot uh, and get back on course. But do you think that there's some common mistakes that a lot of new business owners make or a lot of families that have kind of been in the business for a long time make, and they're not really realizing that they're making these mistakes? I'm going to use a personal example and uh, because I sort of see myself as a bit of a family business, but I've seen it in others, so it really applies to both, and that is impatience. I think our our mental model for how we operate is, is that success comes quickly. In point of fact, if you look at most business successful business, not unlike uh, startups nowadays, everybody looks at these things that go into the billions of dollars overnight. Well, those are the ones that are sort of talked about, not the thousands of businesses that fail because they're looking for instantaneous you know, results. Most of it is with going with singles and doubles and triples, occasionally at a home run. But being more patient and staying the course uh, and recognizing that if you run a business, you can't just lead a business. You've got to be able to both lead and manage. So you can delegate to a point, but you also have to know what's going on. And so it's knowing when to shift from leading to managing, from managing to leading that will make you a successful leader of your own organization. Jerry, if, if people listening want to find you, do you have a website that they should go to? Yeah, it's uh, Gerald at gpulvermacherassociates.com, Gerald at gpulvermacherassociates.com. That's your email. That's that note, uh, uh, sorry, it's email, right. So the gpulvermacherassociates, triple W, gpulvermacherassociates.com. That's oh, right. Fantastic. And you mentioned golf yeah. as a hobby. Are there other things that you say in my off times, these are the things that I really want to be spending most of my time doing? I love traveling. And this this uh, winter, I'm going to be a, spending a month in Tel Aviv because many of my relatives live there in Israel. I'll be two weeks in Dubai, Cairo, and the Nile. And COVID-dependent, I'll decide what I do in March and April. But I've committed two weeks every month, this except for January, where I'm gone for the entire month, 
to travel. I haven't done it in quite a while because of COVID. So I'm sort of trying to make up for it a little bit. I try to make sure at least five times a week I'm in the gym or doing some form of exercise. I play a little golf. I cycle. I love cycling. I've cycled for, oh, geez, at least 35, 40 years on a regular basis. I used to ski, but I, <laughs> I'm staying away from the cold temperatures now. Totally don't blame you. Yeah. So we're trying to catch up on a little travel ourselves. It feels like it's been forever right. uh, since we've been able to go anywhere. So enjoy your travels, Jerry. It's been fantastic conversation. I've honestly learned so much about how business owners need to be thinking about transitions, about working with their team, and about leadership development from both you and your coworkers. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a great conversation with Dr. Jerry Pulvermacher of Jerry Pulvermacher and Associates. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Business in Paradise Palm Beach podcast with Carrie Stamp, founder of Carrie Stamp and Company, Principal Wealth Advisors. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the Commonwealth Financial Network. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Carrie Stamp and Company is located at 110 Bridge Road to Cuesta, Florida, 33469. Securities and advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network member FINRA SIPC, a registered investment advisor.